The interactions aren't classical, but the properties are. Okay. I'm glad that we can be so choosy about how we're doing this. This is wonderful. This episode was made possible by generous supporters on Patreon. Something that's very important to keep in mind as we move forward, right? That quantum mechanics sort of brings to light a discrepancy in how people view physics. Sure. We like to view physics as though we're finding some deeper understanding about the universe, but it's not really what physics is about. Physics is about making predictions. Okay. Right? We want to be All able to- All science is about making predictions, right? Right. Well, you, exactly. So this, what we try to do in physics is we try to come up with a model that's going to predict future behaviors of things, okay. right? So in this case, quantum mechanics is predicting future behaviors of quantums or, you know, little quantum particles. Right, okay. It allows us to make accurate predictions. Correct. Using this branch of science. Right. But this video, this video is about what we call interpretations of quantum mechanics. Okay. So even though this model is very good at making predictions and everyone agrees that that's true, mm -hmm. many of us still want it to also give us a deeper understanding of physics and of the universe. The problem is there are a lot of possible ways to interpret it that haven't been ruled out by experiment yet. I'm sure that that's difficult. It is. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Cutting edge uh, science, you know. And I guess just to just to be clear, this video is not a comprehensive list of interpretations of quantum mechanics. It is just we're just covering a, a few examples to get an idea of why it's so difficult to do this. One so. cannot cover everything. Right. One of the first major interpretations is called the Copenhagen interpretation. And don't don't get out of my case about this. I'm just talking about history here. I know there's a lot of Are we, are we feeling a little defensive here? All right. <laughs> there are a lot of a lot of Copenhagen interpretation haters out there. Okay. You're not condoning it. You're just stating that this is an interpretation that exists. Right. But first, we're going to start with there's actually like two different kinds. There's something we call the weak Copenhagen interpretation and the strong Copenhagen interpretation. And I assume that this does not actually have to do with like how scientifically like verbose they are. No, yeah. it, ha it has to do with how strongly it speaks about the nature of the universe. Okay. So the original one, the one that they, I think it was Heisenberg in 1929 talked about this interpretation and this one is the weak interpretation. Okay. Where basically it's called weak because it doesn't really interpret anything. It takes the stance that you were saying earlier where, well, maybe it doesn't actually say anything about the universe. It's just a really good model that makes great predictions. Sure. And if it's a good model that makes great predictions, I mean, it doesn't, it's not useless. You know what I mean? Right. That was a, a pretty decent place to be. It's it's summarized in one one statement that a lot of quantum physics teachers like to use. Shut up and calculate. Oh, sure. I've heard this before. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure I've said it before. I'm sure that's where I've heard it before. <laughs> right. That's sort of the, the idea, like stop trying to read into any, any of this stuff, just shut up, calculate the prediction and move on with your life. I mean, I have to be honest, if I was a physicist, this would be appealing to me. That's very much my personality type. Right. It takes the philosophy out of it. It does. Uh, it's a very experimental approach. As a theoretical physicist, uh, I can't stand for that. Mm -hmm. So. We're going to try and take some more, uh, we're going to take some stronger approaches to this. All right, so next up, the strong Copenhagen interpretation, which is something that's developed over the last, you know, the several decades after Heisenberg gave this talk. Which was in 29? 29, yeah. Okay. It takes it one step further and says, not only does this wave function for an electron describe the electron's behavior once it's used, to calculate something. The wave function before the collapse is also something that physically exists. It is a thing that is real and says something about the universe. Okay. About that electron that we're trying to examine. Okay. So the weak one says this isn't actually real. It's just math that helps us predict things. Right. And the strong one says it is math and it does help us predict things and also it's real. Right. Okay. Right, that the wave function is a very real thing. Mm-hmm. And that is literally how the electron exists 
before it collapses into one of these regular states. So for the weak one, what do they think the electron exists as, if not the wave function? They don't. They don't think electrons exist? It, no, it is a very agnostic approach to quantum mechanics. We're not going to make any judgments at all I see. about the electron. I see. I feel like that's not useful or helpful because the electron does exist though. Right. So what's Somehow. the point? Because it, it, like I said, it's a very experimental approach. So it's very useful in just setting your preconceived notions aside, making the calculations, maybe building something like a transistor, which is the foundation of all modern electronics. I find it so interesting that this ends up being, I mean, we're not gonna make any judgments about electrons, but also we're going to go ahead and make an actual thing that utilizes electrons. I yeah. feel like these two things don't don't go together. As you can imagine, like, I mean, none of these interpretations we're gonna be talking about today would exist if people were satisfied with that. Okay, fair enough. It was just, uh, let's just put this aside and move on. But then, you know, people would come up and be like, hold on a second. We need all types. Right. It's okay, all right. Right. One of the things that we're gonna find as we go through today is that all interpretations of quantum mechanics have a problem. Different problems? Dif this? Different problems. Okay. For example, the strong Copenhagen interpretation that says electrons exist as this superposition. The major problem that that has is something we call determinism. That things are planned out ahead of time. Right. Things are not random. The universe is not random. Mm -hmm that everything is determined, right? Right. It takes things like free will out of the picture. Right. There are a lot of physicists out there that have a really huge problem with quantum mechanics being non-deterministic. And so this idea, this strong Copenhagen interpretation that, that these particles are inherently probabilistic mm -hmm. is a problem for people, but it, it because it violates determinism. It says that the universe is not deterministic. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if the science says that it's not deterministic, it's probabilistic, then like, update yourselves. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion on that. Quantum physicists have tried to come up with a, a way for quantum mechanics to be deterministic. Okay. They've tried to force it. I was gonna say, let's squeeze it into the box. How right. does it work? The problem with a lot of these different interpretations is that when you you come up with a way to interpret quantum mechanics so that it fixes one problem, it creates a different one. Sure, believable. Also, I would just like to say that I am innately against doing science with a particular goal in mind. That's not how science is done. You're not doing good science. So right. I'm, I am going into this interpretation judging it. What ends up getting sacrificed when you force determinism onto quantum mechanics is something we call causality. Okay. The order of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. I th the best ways I found to define each of these things, determinism and causality, is that determinism is that the universe is, is not random. Probabilities are only zero or one. Zero or 100%. Okay. There is no 50% chance of anything. It either is going to happen or it isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's determinism. Okay. Causality is, like I said, it's the, the order of cause and effect. It's that causes in the past lead to effects or events in the future. The idea that if we knew everything about all of the particles in the universe right now, we could predict the entire history, past and future. And so this new interpretation doesn't abide by that. Right. In order to get determinism back into quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. we have to sacrifice causality, usually. Okay. There is an entire category of interpretations of quantum mechanics called retro causality, mm -hmm. where not only can effects travel into the future from the past, they can also travel into the past from the future. Wonderful. They can retro retroactively cause something. So retro causality, right? So that's, okay. the, that's the idea. Okay, why, how? Tell me how we came to this conclusion. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not really a conclusion. It's just a guess. 
Tell me how we came to this guess. All right, so there's there's one example. It's called the uh, the transactional interpretation, where mm -hmm. basically a particle like an electron creates and it has a, a wave function associated with it, right? Okay. And so what ends up happening is this wave function, which it, it is affected by wave functions traveling from the past, right? Some other particle in the past, its wave function moves forward into the future and it affects this electron. Sure, that makes sense. Right. Now, the idea is that particles complete wave function is a past and future wave function. So not only are things sending information into the future to affect particles and events in the future, they're also sending wave function, another half of their wave function into the past to affect events in the past. Are all events affected by each wave function that is produced? It can get rather complicated if your system isn't isolated, but that's true of anything in quantum mechanics. Isolated systems don't exist. Right. Unless we're um, talking about the universe, right? Right. Right. Uh, so technically it's not possible, but we can get close enough that these effects start to show up. Not the retro causality effects, but probably probability quantum mechanics stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So the idea is that when you have, you take a measurement in the future, the particles involved in that experiment, that measurement, can travel back in time and change the behavior of the particle you measured. So anyway, the point is retrocausality yes. fixes the determinism problem, mm -hmm. right? So we can look back and we can say, oh, well, these two entangled particles, they had, they had stuff you know, they, they were they were predetermined to do what they were gonna do, but like, it's only because there are signals traveling forward and backward in time and because the experiment tra sent information back in time to affect the particles mm -hmm. to make them do certain things. Okay. Because it, they, they know that you did the experiment in the future because retrocausality. Okay, that's complicated. I think that you all should know that I hate time travel uh, innately in movies or whatever. It always is so complicated. Right. So I am not inclined to jump on board with this one. Uh, and if you've seen any of my videos, you know that I don't think time travel is possible. So I'm sure you can guess how I feel about retrocausality. Okay, so retrocausality is something that fixes determinism some of the time, mm -hmm. right? But quantum entanglement also brings up another problem. Okay. We have two other issues that come into play, not just determinism and causality, but also something we call locality and realism. Locality and realism. Right. Okay. Locality is essentially that a particle can only be influenced by things adjacent to its location, right next to it. Well, so that would innately disagree with the quantum entanglement thing that we just talked about. Right, so that's that's a problem that quantum entanglement we need to address. Okay. Essentially, locality means that the speed of light limit is maintained in all circumstances. Okay. Things cannot travel faster than light. Now, realism is that particles always have single classical properties they behave just like billiard balls. Okay. It's just that we don't understand what's happening enough, but they do exist classically. They exist classically, but we don't understand how they work. Right. I feel which, like that's an oxymoron. That will make sense as we cover some of these next couple of interpretations. Okay. But in 1964, there's this guy named John Stuart Bell. He came up with and designed an experiment that proves without a doubt that locality and realism cannot happen at the same time. It is physically impossible. It either follows classical mechanics or it has classical properties or it interacts with local particles. Right. But not at the same time. Right. And so what we say is that local realism, not a thing. Now you can have non-local realism where particles interact over vast distances violating the speed of light limit, but are real and have real properties. Or- Can you be real and have real properties while violating the speed of light? Apparently some people think so. I feel like that doesn't make sense. So th that's one option. The other option is that you have non-real locality. The speed of light limit is maintained, but these particles don't have properties before you measure them. I think that's my favorite one. That seems to make the most sense to me. Okay. 
that one happens to be a, at least the example we're going to talk about that does that, mm -hmm. is going to be the one that is, is gaining a lot of popularity lately. Ooh, whoop, whoop. So let's start with the one that violates locality. Okay. That lets particles interact over any distance instantaneously. But classically but exist with actual properties. Okay. The interactions aren't classical, but the properties are. Okay. I'm glad that we can be so choosy about how <laughs> we're doing this. This is wonderful. So this first one is something called the pilot wave model. Pilot as in like a pilot or pilot as in like the first one? Pilot as in like a pilot. Okay. <laughs> the idea is that the waves that are described in quantum mechanics aren't the actual particles. They're just these waves that exist in the space in some other something that we don't understand. And we said we're doing non-local realism right now, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. The idea is that there's some kind of substance that we don't understand, not an actual like substance, but okay. there is something that fills the universe mm. that has waves in it. Mm. And those waves guide the particles. And so they only look like they behave randomly because there's this very complex wave stuff happening underneath them. On the quantum level. Right. Okay. And so these little tiny itty bitty quantum waves. Mm -hmm. If you were to imagine some kind of like little, I don't know, like a little styrofoam ball floating on the surface of a tank of water. Mm -hmm. And then you put waves in the water, the particle's gonna do all sorts of weird stuff. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this wave is affecting it, a wave that we can't see. Sure. And quantum mechanics describes describes the wave in that stuff. Okay. It doesn't describe the actual particles. I am, what, disinclined to <laughs> whatever. I don't like it. I, I know. It sounds completely ridiculous. It does. But I feel like we're not following Occam's razor at this point. Right. I don't think we are with the other one either, but we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So the idea there is that the particles are like billiard balls. They have properties, they do exist in the way that we understand particles to exist. They're just affected by this complex like undercurrent. They are not the wave, but there are waves and they affect them. Yes. Okay. And whatever this stuff is that's waving can violate the speed of light limit. Hmm. Even though the particles themselves can't. This is very complex. Yes. <laughs> Now this does address the quantum entanglement problem because if this substance can, yes, and I say that with sarcasm in my voice, this substance communicates faster than light, then it's okay for one particle to immediately collapse the wave function of the other particle because these waves are happening in this like under material. Sure. This under substance that's controlling the quantum world. It's, it's the, the under substance. substance. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm making it sound like science fiction, uh, but like, is it's it pretty, not, it's pretty close. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yeah. I mean, technically it's all science fiction until it's experimentally validated. Right. Right? So this one is called the many worlds interpretation. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Heard of that one before. Uh, I think a lot of people would have been very disappointed if I didn't talk about this today. Well, let's do it then. The idea with the many worlds model interpretation, I should say, is that there are an infinite number of universes mm -hmm. and there is essentially one wave function that describes the entire multiverse. Okay. A very complex wave function. And as certain interactions take place and measurements happen, the wave functions, the sort of sub wave functions of each individual universe become unentangled where they start in this sort of entangled state where they're all related to each other. And then once measurements are made, once it becomes known to the universe, not necessarily to a person, once it becomes known what kind of state the particle is in, the universe kind of splits. It sounds like you're saying that all of these waves, that there are enough waves for like all of the splitting that it's eventually going to be doing. Like all of those waves exist. Yes. But that would also sound pretty deterministic though, yes? Yes. Because it has to, you already have to have that wave existing in order for it to split. Yes. Right? Right. And so that's, this is a major, a major reason that this model, this interpretation is so popular. Hmm. It's because its only problem is realism. Okay. It is deterministic, it's causal, and it's local. It just isn't real. 
it's not real. Right. No big deal. This is fine. We're fine. Okay, so so the idea is that these universes split apart. Now, it doesn't mean that an entire universe is created at the measurement. It's often described like that, and that's completely ridiculous. That's not what's happening. We're saying- yes, That is the ridiculous thing here. Glad we ironed that out. We're gonna draw the line. <laughs> right. The idea is that all these universes already exist. It's just that they become unentangled and separate from each other. They, were, they existed before, they were just entangled, and now they're not. Okay. When that information becomes known to the universe about these particles, they become separated in the multiverse, the quantum multiverse. This is wild. Yes. I just feel like when you're talking about particles, the number of universes that we're talking about is absurd. Right. I mean... Particles and events with those particles. Right. I mean, because you're not even talking about people doing something. You know what I mean? You're talking right. about particles doing something. And there are so, there are so many. So many. It's, I mean, it's an unimaginable number of universes. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. But it's not real, so it's okay. <laughs> well, it, we're saying that the particles I aren't know. particles. I know. It, it's funny to say that it's not real, but that's not really what realism is saying. So that's the idea, right? That the, the universe is, you can map them across time, so it's causal. The probability of something, an event happening in the multiverse somewhere is equal to one or 100%. You just might not be in the universe where it happens, but it does happen. So it is deterministic. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a 50-50 chance in quantum mechanics that says, oh, well, this event's gonna happen or it's not gonna happen, like a radioactive decay of a particle or something, what the many worlds interpretation says is, well, that does happen in half the universes and it doesn't in the other half. Sure. But it happens somewhere. Right. If there's a chance, if there's a non-zero chance it's going to happen, it happens somewhere in the multiverse. Right. I mean, which is kind of comforting on one side. Sure. And a little concerning on the other side. Right. But the effects are local, right? So there's locality is maintained because the interaction happens locally. Right. It doesn't happen over vast distances. Mm -hmm. This is okay with quantum entanglement because everything's deterministic and causal. The, the particle on Earth and the particle on Mars don't have to communicate with each other. They were already predetermined to be the way they were. Ugh. We just didn't know about it. I don't love that. Determinism isn't my favorite thing. Well, because it doesn't allow for free will. And I, I have a problem with that. Sure. Which is why I am very, very firmly under the non-deterministic umbrella. Yeah. Whatever interpretation I get behind, it better be non-deterministic. Or it. I'm not getting behind it. Sure. The hardcore physicists are starting to get really get behind this many worlds interpretation. But right? not the softcore physicists. <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> When I was starting to like really dive into this and, and learn about it, I, I, I can understand why it's so appealing to people. It solves so many problems, but it does it in a way that I feel violates the most important tenet of coming up with a model, and that is Occam's razor. Right, agree. We have to assume a, 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 an infinite or nearly infinite number of universes exist. Mm -hmm even though we have no physical evidence whatsoever that they exist. Right. That cannot be the, like, least complicated answer. Right. Occam's razor does not say that explanations can't be complicated. It just says that we need to start with the simpler ones. Right. And if we rule them all out and we arrive at something that's complicated, then so be it. Uh, that's how quantum mechanics happened. Uh -huh. But I think that I think there are better options. I think it's good to have many hypotheses, right? Yes. Because it's it's good to be able to like get a new idea and assess it, see how it works, see how it doesn't work. And then when you see that like there are X, Y, and Z reasons why this doesn't appear to be the one, let's move on to the next one. You right. know what I mean? I think that it's not good science to get caught on one hypothesis and just keep beating it to death trying to make it work for you. And I'm not talking about the many worlds specifically, I mean mm -hmm. for any of them in general. Something we expect out of scientists in general, right? If you're gonna oppose, if you're going to propose an alternative explanation for something, you better also, at the same time, propose a way to test it. Yeah, or else what good is it? What good is, is a proposed explanation without an experiment that you can do to test it? Right. Agree. And I acknowledge that our whole conversation today existed because we just don't have the experimental means 
to test these right. hypotheses. But that means that they do need to be treated as such, though. Right. I think that's the biggest problem with the many worlds interpretation is that it's, it is completely untestable. Right. There is literally no experiment you can come up with mm -hmm. that allows us to test whether or not other universes exist. At least as far as we know. As right now. Right. I'm not discounting it in the future, but I, it, there's, we can't see any way to do that. And that sort of extends to all of the interpretations, right? The reason we have so many that still work is because we don't have a way to test any of them. Yet. Yet. Just gotta give it, give it some time. Scientists, get on it. It's not gonna be us. It's gotta be you, right? Right. Now, the thing is, none of these interpretations go against what quantum the math in quantum mechanics says. The math supports them all. Right. The idea here is that we're trying to explain what the math means. What do the probabilities in quantum mechanics actually mean about the universe? Okay. Out of all four of these things, determinism, causality, locality, and realism, in my personal opinion, locality is the most important of the four. You uh, like things being able to interact with each other. Right. So it would go it, in order of importance, I would say locality, causality, determinism, and then realism. Okay. I'm generally okay with that. I'm open to a discussion about the last two, realism versus determinism, but I think locality is more important than realism, and so I am willing to sacrifice realism to maintain locality. And there are so many times in the history of physics where we have... That like we've come across a situation where we did, we thought locality was broken only to discover a few years later that it wasn't actually broken, that we just didn't understand what was going on. Sure. Right, and I, I don't think that this is an exception. So I think locality is maintained. Okay. On that note, do you feel like you have a deeper understanding of the problems that quantum physicists face? I do feel like I have a deeper understanding of the problems. I didn't know where that question was gonna go, and I honestly didn't know if I was gonna be able to answer yes to it, but that question, absolutely yes, I can answer. Awesome. The goal of this video was to give people an idea of like why this, this process is so difficult and like what obstacles we're facing as we try to answer these questions. Sure. And what some of the issues are with the different, not just the issues, like some of the good things that they have going for them, and then also the the things they don't have going for them. Right. Sure. What about you guys? Did you feel like you got a decent idea of why this problem is so hard? Let us know in the comments. And until next time, remember. It's okay to be a little crazy. <laughs> Right, things don't just teleport like that. I mean, they, they can under some circumstances, but mm -hmm. it's... Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not like the Star Trek transporter. Well, it's, it's not like the Star Trek... Or is it? <laughs>